it's an Archeo Death interview with Professor Howard Williams and his guest. Welcome everybody to an Archeo Death interview with me, Professor Howard Williams, and my extra, extra, and one extra, extra special guest, because we're not only with someone with a variety of expertise and interest in archaeology and heritage, but we have the very own Andy Brockman of the Watching Brief of the pipeline of so many um, social media and media appearances. Thank you, Andy, for joining us. Would you be please give yourself a proper introduction rather than my babbling, and I will start quizzing you on all aspects of mortuary matters. Well, th thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, Howard. Thanks for the invitation to to come onto the show. Um, it's it's a it's a great pleasure. It, it, I, I feel as though the table was a term because we yes. interviewed you various times on the uh, on the watching brief itself. So I I, I, I hope you're not going to get uh, you're, you're going to feel you need to get your revenge over the next uh, Finally, hour or so. Or however long you're going to be talking. <laughs> As, as, as Darth <laughs> Vader would say, <laughs> yes. yes, the power. No, um, no, of course, it's, uh, no, it's, it's all good fun. And thank you. Yes, thank you. I've been on, love being on the watching brief. And it's wonderful that you, you know, we can address something that touches on so much of what you do, but perhaps hasn't been given a dedicated focus in uh, in other interviews. And that's the sort of the fact that so much of what we're doing in archaeology generally and heritage is has a mortuary or mortality dimension and so much of what I've been learning about your career and work has has touched on it and, and so I wondered if you could give us an introduction to yourself and how you got into archaeology in the first place. It's always good to get back to the fundamentals I think um, and, and in fact how I got into the discipline, how I got into archaeology, I, I think uh, things that I was doing way back in the late 1970s as a teenager um they still uh they're still at the core of really what i do now um i as a, 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 for people who don't know so my name is andy brockman i come originally from just outside canterbury in east kent in the uk and uh pretty early on in memory terms um I became really, really interested in history. Um, by the end of primary school, I was reading that Rosemary Sutcliffe novels and uh, alongside those going off and finding, you know, I, I read Eagle of the Ninth and so went off and found books about the Roman legions and things like that. So, you know, so far, so probably fairly common for a lot of archeologists, certainly of my generation. Um, and then, uh, as I went through secondary school, through a family friend, um, I, my mum, in fact, um, was asked, would Andy like to go and work on an excavation? And the upshot of that was that I worked on a, an excavation by the Ashford Archaeological Society, in fact it was, uh, on a, a head of a, a gravel pit um, just outside of a village called Ickham in, 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 in Kent. So it was about it was a couple of miles away from where I was living at the time. And in the course of that excavation, which we'd now term, um, uh, well, what then would have been termed a rescue dig, uh, because it was ahead of the, the, the site being destroyed by, as I said, um, gravel quarrying. OK. Um, I ended up uh one weekend um working on a roman uh booty burial Ooh. which appeared to have been placed in a uh what was now plowed out was probably then an extant uh bronze age uh round barrow um but i, I, I and uh i i my most vivid memory of it. I, I don't remember it in, in, in a huge amount of detail, but I, I have a sort of um, caption sort of cartoon memory of uh, excavating the, uh, particularly the, the, the hobnail sole boots of uh, this Roman person, uh, the remains of this Roman person, but also within the, uh, within the excavation were uh, remains from the Bronze Age as well. Wow. And that juxtaposition, that yeah, that, that, that juxtaposition of the two, two, well, well at least two people, um, separated by 1500 years, then being excavated by us 
again, almost 2000 years later and the lives that they represented and the lives in between the, the two burials and then the lives between that Roman person and us, it, it was, it, it really, I, I suppose, moved me to thinking about, you know, time and space and people and our place in these stories. Um, and I carried on doing work like that in the area into my late teens. I did work experience with the uh, then, uh, well, still uh, Canterbury Archaeological Trust, one of the oldest um, local archaeological uh, trusts uh, who were really in, a, in on the ground floor at the beginning of developer funded work and, and work in uh, ahead of, uh, of building when archaeology was beginning to be recognised as having a place in modern culture that it wasn't acceptable yeah that it wasn't po possible just to you know lamb in with a 360 and strip out anything to uh, uh, that's in the way of the foundations of the new tower block you know, or the new supermarket that's being built or whatever um so i was, I was doing that in cans where i worked on again sites of various periods from uh, prehistoric through to the early medieval uh, through to the modern actually relatively modern um and but I was also at that time getting involved in drama and theatre. And when I came to choose my university career, uh, it was a toss up between whether I went down the archaeology route or whether I went down the uh, drama route. Oh, and, and you yeah. chose drama. Um, and you can, I chose drama, yeah. Uh, as my headmaster at the time said, um, Brockman, are you sure you're not being carried away on a wave of romanticism? Uh, but uh, he was he was a Cambridge physicist, so he didn't get it. Um, but no, uh, very, very, very fine headmaster, actually, very, very inspiring head teacher. But um, a certain blind spot in cultural degrees. But um, no, I, I, I ended up at Bristol for three years doing um, doing drama theatre studies, and in fact, my main job for twenty years after that was uh, in theatre as a technician, uh, lighting designer, production manager. So, but I think I never left archaeology altogether. I was always trying to keep up with the reading, watching the TV documentaries. Um, and that, uh, again, maybe some of our colleagues might question it, but I've always felt actually there's a lot uh, in common between um, cultural sectors and particularly, you know, theatre, drama, the performing arts and archaeology, because in the end, at least at one very fundamental level, they're both about storytelling. Absolutely. And they're both about and they're both about teamwork. And they're both about sharing the work with the public at their best. And at their, at their most nutritious, I think. And so. Even though now the vast bulk of my work is in archaeology and in fact latterly in, in, which I guess we'll come on to talk about later but sort of um, if you like a sort of an investigative journalism about archaeology and how it fits into other aspects of modern society um, I, I, you know I, I think it's really important to maintain that hinterland maintain that wide view to look out rather than look in all the time yes and yeah and then to say in the end that fundamental importance to us as creatures i think you know as, as 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 human beings of sharing stories with each other and sharing conversations about those stories wow uh, so you spent a large portion of your life doing that how did the transition back to archaeology take place was it was it did you did you see it coming or was it active or did it just sort of transpire in a sort of happenstance type of way well, as, as I said, I, I, I always um, I always maintained the sort of link in terms of wanting to stay up to date with what was going on. Um, we had, you know, that, did, you had the National Trust membership and the, and the, and the history, you know, English Heritage is then was um, membership and we, we, you know, we, we go to places at the weekend and that kind of thing. Um, I worked in places like Coventry where we had the Lunt Fort just up the road. Um, not to mention the the medieval city and then the the rebuild of the medieval city after the, uh, the World War II bombing 
and the post-war reconstruction which we often forget to mention yeah um in, in, you know uh, and and um uh, and, and then for example in that case um i i worked on a community play in um in 1980 uh, in in, in uh, was it 1990 i think it was um where uh yes 1990 it was the the, the anniversary of the Coventry blitz in in november 1940 uh, operation moonlight sonata as the luftwaffe called it um and and there uh, we were trying to tell a story for the people of coventry about what was still living memory for yes. many people um where something like uh, nearly a thousand people were killed that night and the whole city was disrupted both by the destruction of the uh, that brought by the, the luftwaffe bombs but also by the fact that for nights afterwards the city effectively emptied as people headed out into the countryside uh to, to, because they were worried that the you know the, there'd be a repeat yeah and so you know we, we were telling a story we were memorializing the wonderful woman who ran the theater green room um in fact took that week took the week off of the show because as a child she lived through the night of moonlight sonata the night of november the 14th and just didn't want to go back there she didn't want to be have, have, have a memory triggered and that, you know, that's a really important that was a really important lesson for me uh, an, an ethical lesson which again um it, it and, and again we might talk about how sometimes uh that isn't taken into account when we're talking about uh the mortuary work in 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 archaeology and particularly how it's presented yeah. to the public um so yeah i mean uh, it, you know it, it, um though, though that, that crossover w w w was happening and then i can sum up why i really came back into archaeology um in the in the mid 90s in two words and that's time team um I was, and in fact, I can pinpoint it exactly. Um, I was sitting in a pub, uh, in a pub garden in Oxford, uh, with my partner. We were having lunch because we, we 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 hadn't visited Oxford before, so we we wanted to visit Oxford. And um, as you do when you're in Oxford, you go to Oxbow Books. And uh, I was stocking up on, you know, the stuff that had been discounted in Oxbow. And we were sat having lunch in the in the midst of this visit, and we were chatting about history and archaeology and, and, I, and, I, and I suddenly said well actually time team had just started and I said actually that program gets what I like about archaeology and about working in theatre and it's what I said earlier it's the teamwork it's the storytelling um, but also actually at its best it's really good fun it's a re really rewarding thing to do and I think sometimes in the professionalization of archaeology we sometimes lose sight of that in trying to remember remind people that we're a serious profession and we're there alongside the you know the chartered surveyors and so on um it's uh, for me one the great thing about archaeology it, it's more than just a discipline it's all sorts of things it's this glorious mashup of science and culture it, it's stem but it's also the arts and, and, and you know it, it, it so I can't think of many other disciplines like it. It's certainly a unique thing. And one of the things that I find fascinating, what got me into archaeology from Time Team and from books is the mortuary angle. And, you know, as you said, you're encountering the dead, even if it's only occasionally, you know, face to face mm. with skeletal or other kinds of human remains. It's about knowing that you're dealing with past generations and you have our responsibilities to them. So I suppose my, ne my next question is sort of really where, where did it go from there in terms of your specific issues or projects where you found yourself face to face with not necessarily the dead, but with mortuary issues and the, you know, the, the professionalism and ethics we have to display in that, that difficult and uh, sensitive area of archaeological field work and research well i uh, i i trained I, I i i was lucky enough i'm one of the last really i suppose generations that was able to retrain through the adult education route uh -huh. relatively cheaply um i and, and i you know the, the whole my whole 
you know, second career is thanks to Birkbeck College at the University of London. Um, by because by doing first of all uh, the courses for certificate and diploma, and then the, in fact I was one of the first um, people to uh, my, my 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 year was the first cohort to take the field archaeology masters. Uh, oh uh, right. Um, and that wonderful opportunity because we were taught by really good people. Of course, course leader was Harvey Sheldon, who come up through the mu um, the Museum of uh, London's urban urban unit. He dug in Southwark in the nineteen seventies, um, and in particular, he and a number of other of our tutors were intimately involved in the whole Rose Theatre row. Oh yes. Um, so yeah. Uh, 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 we we were being taught by people who were brilliant practical field archaeologists but also were very inspirational teachers they, they they chose their tutors very well and um what we did what we learned was very much uh it, it wasn't just the practical framework of you know archaeology by period looking at uh, and, and you know specifically that you know um we're looking at the importance of uh, cemeteries in the London area for, all, you know, obviously London's famous for some, some of its Roman cemeteries. In, in, in Southwark, people will be familiar with the uh, the alleged, uh, you know, uh, gladiator lady and uh, oh, uh, yes. other, uh, 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 but also um, other uh, uh, other grave sites uh, on the on the out, on, on the on the fringes of the city, um, but also um, the um, monastic uh, graveyards, places like uh, the cemetery um, associated with the monastic site in Croydon and various other, uh, the, you know, the, the, the people who were teaching us have worked on. Um, so we, we, we were learning those, those those frameworks, but also how the archaeology existed in the real world uh, alongside the development that was going on then in London. And in fact, some of the stuff that was being, uh, some of the um, developer funded work that was starting to happen in London is now being knocked down and rebuilt and investigated again. Um, you know, Thirty years on, that's the sort of approximate shelf life of some city office blocks. Um, I that's quite sad. disturbingly short. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, so, so that that's that was my professional grounding, if you like. And. Um, I also, um, just as I was finishing my master's, I um, got into, uh, we, 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 we moved uh, to Woolwich, where I live now. And I did briefly did some volunteering for the uh, Greenwich Museum as it was in the process of moving uh, to a new site. And uh, I was working on the, uh, basically, the reserve collection, the, the the stuff that was in the archive store, stuff that some of which had been, it might have been sort of reboxed about twenty years ago, but the, the, these boxes that were from excavations in, the, you know, that were done in the in the borough, 1900, 1910, um, probably hadn't really been looked at much since, and uh, places like Lessness Abbey, and um, stuff from Woolwich Arsenal and, uh, and and other sites around the area. Um, uh, um, a um, Charlton Camp, which was a, a almost certainly a, a Iron Age, pre-Roman Iron Age Univellate hill fort, that three quarters of it have been quarried away as ballast for ships on the Thames in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. Ah, uh, yeah. So issues of protection and protest were yep. featured highly in those your your engagement with archaeology and the roast yeah. you know so not necessarily the dead but but sites that matter in a, in a in a national and an international sense i suppose you know and how mm. archaeologists can be advocates and activists even in some cases is, is that appropriate description i think very much so very much so um and uh, i mean I, I won't go into it in detail it's been covered in in a number of uh, of books and so on but the um certainly the, the rose controversy really can be said to be the uh foundation of modern developer funded archaeology it was such a debacle um that um 
even government was forced to say, wait a minute, this can't ha be allowed to happen again. It was just too much of a mess. Um, just to, to, just to, uh, very, very briefly, a, um, a major office built uh, development was being put down um, just on the on the south side of um, Blackfriars Bridge, uh, opposite the city, and um, it had full planning consent. The archaeologists were in ahead of the uh, ahead of the developer, ahead of the bulldozers and the cranes, and they hit the remains of the Rose Theatre, which is one of the earliest uh, Tudor playhouses on the South Bank. It was where not just Shake some of Shakespeare's earliest plays had their premieres, but also Christopher Marlowe. You know, our two greatest playwrights of that era um there was a physical connection with them that was about to be destroyed <coughs> and um it ended up with uh, then english heritage trying to referee this row between the developer who wanted to go ahead with their development and the archaeological establishment and the theatrical establishment um so uh, Sir lawrence olivier's last public appearance as an actor was uh, in, in a a message to the Rose campaigners. Ian McKellen was there on the picket line alongside archaeologists. Um, and anybody who remembers it, who certainly anybody who was there at the time, it was an absolutely seminal moment in, in British archaeology. And again, it was about memorialization. It was about, you know, this isn't just archaeology isn't just ticking a box for a developer. No. Sometimes this stuff really engages with the public and as archaeologists, we forget that at our peril. I think. I think so. I think so. So, in terms of mortuary sites or memorial mm. dimensions, obviously a lot of your work has been involved in military dimensions of that. Perhaps you sort of expand on some of those examples of, you know, dealing with the recent dead or sites where, you know, mm. people met their deaths if their remains might not be there anymore. You know, they're both aspects aren't they of how people connect to individuals and stories that that's right and it's something um i always um remind people certainly when i'm doing talks for example that um when i'm doing talks say about uh 1940 and how britain prepared to be uh, for a possible invasion across the channel um and the 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 blitz the anti-aircraft defense systems and the airfields and so on um i always make the point that i am not celebrating this stuff no it's part of our national story but it was you know it it was a war we can argue about the morality of of war you know we're deeply involved in an argument about the morality of war at the moment over what's happening in the middle east and you know, some of those arguments could be just as uh, sharp in terms of you know the past yes uh, you know, there's still that the, the, you know the concept of the good war and the uh, concept that world war ii was a good war because it um the you know the war in europe was against the fascist dictatorship that murdered millions of people simply because of their religion and and cultural and ethnic background so you know uh, 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 these are really uh, knotty issues. And I remember, in fact, I remember uh, uh, having you know, this sort of uh, debate back in my mind when I was doing a talk to a, um, uh, a Jewish women's um, coffee group in, uh, in in South East London uh, a while back. Oh, yeah. uh, among the audience of which was a, was somebody who come over in the Kinder Transport. Again, another very pertinent issue at the moment. Yeah. Um, but um, no, the 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 the, 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 the work in uh, conflicts archaeology of the archaeology of modern conflict um, that grew directly actually ironically out of uh, time team again because um, back in 2007 um, my uh, Harvey my, my tutor uh, and, and, and master's supervisor had uh, he'd done a time team and the way time team often work the producers for the next series would ring up people who'd been on the program previously and said do you know any good sites that we might get in on Ah, and <laughs> and uh, I just started I, I, in 2005. I'd done a community project with some lottery money, um, looking at the um, uh, a site uh, on a farm actually, just down the. Uh, it's, it's, it's a city farm, uh, an urban farm, uh, just down the road from me here at Shooters Hill, and um, we were looking at the um, a, a World War II anti-aircraft rocket site that had then become a prisoner of war camp. Uh, 
Oh. And we did that. Um, we did that with um, uh, lottery money that was uh, part of a funding stream that was for the 2005 anniversary of VE Day. Um, anyway, uh, cut to the chase. Uh, Harv got rung up uh, by uh, probably Jim Moore, I think it was, uh, from Time Team, uh, and um, said, D "Do you know any any good sites in the London area?" And Harvey apparently said, uh, well, there's a stu uh, an ex-student of mine who's doing some interesting stuff at Shooters Hill. You might want to have a word with him. So, again, cut to the chase. Uh, Jim rang me up. Uh, we talked about other things that were in the area and things that we might look at together. Because one of the great things about Time Team with its absolute, in its heyday, was that it, it could facilitate work evaluations that would take probably years of work with funding bodies and funding applications to get done and yes because they had the money from channel four they could just green light it and so we did an evaluation on on, on shooters hill on a world war one um anti-aircraft gun site okay. um and world war ii barrage balloon site and in fact the irony is we we missed the world war one um anti-aircraft gun site because uh, there was a gap in our documentary knowledge at that point but um so this big blob on the geophysics was just dismissed as ground clutter okay. um we got we got the, we got the barrage balloon site and that was fine and it appeared in the program but what we also got thanks to the ge geophysics was a wonderful very early uh pre-roman iron age uh, metal working site that was important enough that uh, historic england stumped up some money to do a proper post x on it Oh, uh, because it's one of the it's one of the, it's one of the earliest iron working sites of its type in the country um you know so but that really fixed me doing conflict archaeology and some of the people i met who were brought in as part of the time team cast people like martin brown rod scott um i've been working with off and on ever since that's forged new connections and so on yeah very much so yeah yeah and uh, you know martin as well as being a very experienced uh field archaeologist consultant used to work for county in sussex now works for one of the big consultancies um but um you know he he uh, was um heading or co-heading up uh, something called the plug street project uh in belgium and rod uh who at the time was a serving soldier and the od expert um, was doing safety cover as well as being a trained archaeologist and it was a you know the the, the, the between the the two of them and then others who who, who i got to know that the, those skill sets um really for me made it possible to get involved in the archaeology of modern conflict do it safely on sites which might be contaminated by unexploded ordnance ammunition you know um but also um because of the connections with the military uh, at, at the time martin was working for the defense infrastructure organization which is uh, sort of the mod's archaeologists okay um who look after archaeology and the mod estate um and they were uh obviously one of the things they were advising on uh, and, and working on in um the work uh, in on the western front was the human remains because you cannot dig on the no. front lines of the western front without finding human remains from all sides and uh, civilians as well and so and unexpectedly so i suppose is one of the things about those human remains different fragmentations different you know different types I, and you know and always I, can, I, I can give you an illustration of that i mean um i um rod invited me over to um spend a week on the western front with the he, he was working with uh, the state of Flanders archaeology team uh, that does work on the on, on that particular geographical area around Ypres, Passchendaele, uh, to use the um, the anglicised version, um, and um, uh, the um, uh, so uh, and, and Rod was um, over for uh, to act as a site supervisor. For them for a week on a, on a site that they were working on uh, again it, uh, um uh, it was at the time they were doing evaluations because state of flanders was proposing the western front as a world heritage site okay. and 
uh, the Monday morning, uh, we walked down onto the onto the site, which is on a farm just outside Ypres. Okay. Uh, and we're going to be working on what we know from air photographs and trench maps are frontline trenches. And the one of the first things I see is, um, is that uh, there's been this uh, machine surface strip, absolutely standard archaeological technique, take off the topsoil. We walk through the farm down past a fence post, which is a uh, World War I um, barbed wire, uh, one, one, one of the um, barb, uh, screw, pit, uh, screw posts that you hang barbed wire off of. I think oh, you yeah. might, might be familiar with them. Yeah. Big, chunky piece of uh, iron with a, uh, a, a, a bit like a can opener, an old, old style can opener. Um, but, you know, a couple of meters long with a, a, a and, and um, heavy, heavy iron, uh, you know, material. So we walk down past a fence that's made up out of, out of this stuff. Um, leaning uh, at the side of a track waiting to be taken away by the Belgian Demineurs is a very large shell, unexploded shell. Which I look at Rod and I say, "Is that okay?" He says, "Yes, yeah, fine." The, the, the demon, uh, the, they'll be they'll be along in a minute. To, yeah, you know, to, to 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 pick it up. And we get down to the to the trench. Uh, I step into this um, uh, into what's going to be our place of work for the next week. And one of the first things I see is a disarticulated human femur with the um, the, the top missing. The the, the, the the ball joint that um, yeah. hit, uh, goes uh, on, on, on goes into the hip missing, and Rod again, very experienced archaeologist, also a soldier, used to dealing with pretty grim stuff in his day job, let alone you know. So yeah. as an archaeologist, um, he do, does that absolutely brilliant duty of care that you have to do for your excavators. And he said, turns to me and he said, are you OK? Do you want to talk about it? And I thought for a moment, I said, no, I'm fine. I was expecting something like this. I'm OK. Thank you. And that's how we continued. And, and um, you know, material like that, it, you know, it, it's it's collected respectfully. It's boxed up. There's not much you can do. You, know, you can't identify somebody from it. So, um, yeah. But it's, it, you know, um, but it's not it's not just thrown on the small heap. Um, so it's integral to, you know, ethical practice is integral to do the very rationale of doing work in that landscape. And, you know, everything mm -hmm. you do is going to involve the dead. You're working for the dead. You may encounter the dead. You've got to constantly work out how to manage this in terms of joking or just, you know, that daily, you know, uh, you know, balance of negotiating around and with it. I suppose it's 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 never going to go away on every level. Is that a fair thing to say? You think? Absolutely so. And and in fact, I mean, I wasn't involved in this, but the the, the uh, Plutrick team, um, including Rod and Martin, were. Um, but uh, around the same time, uh, there was an excavation uh, again just up the road from where we were digging, um, and uh, the remains of from the equipment and badges that were found on his remains uh, were the remains of a soldier, in fact, a private from the Australian Imperial Force, the AIF, which was basically the Australian army that was yeah. present on the Western Front in the, in the, in the First World War. Um, and he was recovered archaeologically. Now, obviously, human remains of any kind you notify to the local authorities well, whichever country you're in you obey the local laws um but also you're involved in that case they knew who was australians so that involved the australian army and the australian uh, government um but also um uh, commonwealth um we had the commonwealth war grades commission which is where most allied human remains will end up of course um, I and, and, and ideally they end up under a, na uh, a, a named headstone. Um, people might be familiar with anyone that's ever visited a, a, a Commonwealth War Graves Commission site. They're incredibly moving, as are in fact the German equivalents in a very much small, 
stark, more probably a more understated way. And we can talk about why that might be another time, maybe. Mm. But certainly um, the uh, CWGC, um, they, everybody, you know, if they can't be identified, they'll get the, you know, a, a, a British soldier known unto God, or if they can identify in the branch of service, a, you know, a member of the Royal Flying Corps, a member of the Royal Air Force or whatever. Um, and the famous Kipling, you know, um, epitaph known unto God. But um, with modern science, it's increasingly possible to uh, identify people if you put the work in. Not every government does it. Now, in this case, the Australians uh, supported a full forensic scientific analysis of the remains. Oh. Um, and so they knew the uh, um, th this was uh, from the the battle of messine they knew which unit had been on that particular part of the battlefield on that day uh -huh. and from the unit's casualty returns they were able to narrow down the number of people this could have been because they knew the rank they knew it was australian um and so work in the archive narrowed it down to a number of possible people um they then were able to use strontium isotope to work out where this person had grown up because fortunately australia is pretty uh, diverse in its geology so somebody from just outside sydney will have a very different strontium return in their teeth to somebody say from the other side of the country we're up in Darwin. Oh. And um, in fact, they were able to narrow down to two areas um, in Sydney and New South Wales where this person may have grown up. Um, with being, with, and with that level of precision, they were able to look at where the missing soldiers had grown up. They identified uh, the family of a missing man called Alan Mather. They traced his current descendants and they got a hard identification by checking his DNA against the DNA of descendants of his family. And so wow. Alan Mather is now buried under a named headstone in a Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery uh, a few kilometres away from where he, his remains were recovered. And he was buried with full military honours with members of the Plug Street team in attendance. So archaeologists are both investigators of the battlefield, but also recoverers and, in a sense, carers in a way for the dead, uh, helping with their identification, their relocation, their connection to the living, and and you are in some cases literally mourners at their own. Their, the, well, in this case, it's not a, a second funeral; it's the first ever funeral that that person's poor remains ever received. Is that and that person and, and 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 people talk a lot about closure and and, and but you know member members of Alan Mather's extended family were there as well so it was a as, as well as the you know the the honor guard from the Australian army and so on so you know it, it was it was a a real coming together and a cultural moment but also a very personal moment and I I think it sort of highlights for me the responsibility of what we can do um, but then again, uh, 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 but also highlighted for me subsequently um, the irresponsibility of another story that I worked on, which was a TV series. Uh, we looked at the background of a TV series called Nazi War Diggers, where oh, the opposite gosh, yes. was encased. So, I mean, maybe we should, you know, make that clear for viewers because we haven't addressed that before. Is that as well as this responsible work on conflict archaeology, there is a a whole nest of series of illicit looting going on, but also TV programmes either, you know, sort of exploiting that treasure hunting aesthetic mm. behaviours. And that programme was one of the few occasions where the archaeology community came together to generally denounce and deride the a TV programme being made about these US-based, uh, um, not they would go on the... Um, 
European context, but they were they were US based uh, TV program and and uh, collectors or whatever. What do they call them? They have all sorts of euphemistic words. They don't call themselves looters, obviously, but what do, what do they call themselves? Like d- detectorists or discoverers or. Well- well, perhaps if I just sort of explain a bit of, bit of the background, uh, in, in, uh, and I have to put my cards on the table here. Um, when the series was in preparation, it wasn't being, it certainly wasn't called Nazi War Diggers uh, at that point, but I was one of a number of colleagues uh, because I was, uh, I've been identified with doing this kind of work. Um, uh, and um, uh, so I, I was rung up one day by a member of the production team. It's actually a British production company. Um, a London-based production company who'd been commissioned oh. by National Geographic, uh, the National Group Geographic Channel, and um, the one of the um, development producers uh, rang me up and said, we, you know, "We're planning this series. You've done this. T- you know, you've done. We've seen your work on Time Team and, and other stuff that you've done. You know, would you come and have a chat about it?" Um, so we, um, we 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 met for. Uh, for coffee in a cafe in King's Cross and uh, I explained well look you know uh, it, it, it was sold as long as you know what advice would you give us we're ah. planning on this we're, 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 we're you know it's one of those classic sort of uh, we, we, we want to tap you up for nothing uh, give you give advice for nothing and and, and, and see where it goes from there. It, it, TV does that a lot um, and um, you learn pretty quickly to say, yeah, yeah, well, I'm happy to meet you. My consultancy fee is. Um, but anyway, that's another story. Uh, no, I, 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 um, we met for, for, for coffee. It was explained that it was a series about the, um, the conflicts in the Baltics in World War Two, and they wanted to uh, have, an, have some archaeological input and da, 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 you know, uh, bullshit, 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 as it turned out. Um, uh, so I, 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 I said, and I, I wrote, you know, long email saying, well, look, I recommend that you, you know, you you uh, you need to have EOD cover. You need to make sure that you're um, you're covered in case you recover human remains, um, etc. You 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 need to be able to, you know, ideally you need to be able to you know, record and uh, and publish, it, not just an artifact hunting. And I didn't hear about it. Next I hear about it is that the this series called Nazi War Diggers is being trailed by uh, Nat Geo. And that's, it's at that point, actually, that the the wrath of the archaeological world descended on them. Um, you know, the, uh, articles in the Daily Mail and all sorts of things, because what they'd actually done, what they ended up doing, uh, was taking uh, a group of metal detectorists, one of whom claimed expertise in identifying World War II ammunition, those not trained in that role at all. Um, uh, so a group of metal detectorists, uh, some of them are members of, what, of, of an outfit uh, that existed at the time called the Extreme Relic Hunters, who specialised in going onto military sites deliberately to look for um, weapons, ammunition, artefacts, which is really risky behaviour. Um, and they partnered them up because it was uh, for, for the American audience with an American, um, basically, uh, dealer in militaria including nazi oh. militaria and as it turned out that the, 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 the initial issues were over the treatment of uh particularly human remains but also weapons and ammunition because i mean put very crudely the format of the program was designed to go and find stiffs and guns they wanted human remains and they wanted weapons. Wow. Um, and you got to the stage where I think it, it's one of the most egregious things I've ever seen in a TV documentary. But you had one of the participants picking up a um, a German steel helmet uh, from one of the Baltic battlefields from uh, the end uh, the brutal fighting that was going on in Latvia in 1944, early 45. And the, the sequence ended up with one of the participants picking up a you know, German steel helmet and literally emptying out the skull of its former owner on camera. It's probably, one, as I say, it's one of the grimmest things I've ever seen on a TV documentary. Um, 
utterly unethical, as was the way they were recovering the human remains, because in contrast to the way Alan Mather and his remains were recovered archaeologically by people who respected what they were doing and had the knowledge to do it properly, um, the way it was done on camera there, they destroyed any possibility that that person's remains could be identified, recovered. Eventually, they'd have been, they were boxed up and were, 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 were handed over to the um, authorities and buried in one of the German war cemeteries in, in, in Latvia. So at least they, you know, they, they ended up uh, in the right place. But I mean, there was no, there was another case in the same program um, where, and again, I, we only found out about this afterwards. I did, uh, I, I did research on it and I investigated it basically to see what else had gone on and wrote this, a number of articles about it you can find them online they're somewhere in the pipeline um, my my website um but uh the other really egregious uh case was a program that was set in poland most of the series was set in latvia this particular episode was set in poland and they were filming on location uh, of a what appears to have been a massacre of civilians german civilians at the end of in the in the chaos of 1945 and two things were really again egregious about it one was the participants uh who'd been cast by the production company and i'll name and shame them because it's in the public domain they were called clear story um clear story were not giving any support to their to their on-screen talent so these guys who are basically metal detectorists and a dealer are thrown into a situation uh, where they're investigating or they're, they're allegedly investigating a war crime. And the way the programme was constructed, it made it look as though they were doing the work. In fact, uh, I contacted the Polish organisation called Pomosht, uh, which was nominally in charge of the work and in fact what was happening according to Pomosh was that the uh, the British guys and the American dealer were being inserted into work that had already been done by the Poles so the whole program was not just a sham contrived but... yeah yeah it was it was contrived and 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 and, and the worst thing of all um one of the participants uh, ended up uh, being closely involved with the remains of what appears to have been a young child um, and he had, he had a young child himself and found it really really upsetting you know that should never have happened it was unforgivable so in terms of these worst case scenarios of bad practice that attracted to the the mm. i don't know what is it that draws people to conflict archaeology it's the heroism the the the, the dramatic history the militarism the you know is it is it all i mean why why the, i mean as well as the monetary value of the things that can be acquired from these battlefields mm. i mean it's a mixture heady mixture of 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 draws isn't it of attractions very much so. Uh, yeah. uh, and certainly, as far as in fact, just just on the on on the issue of um, World War Two in Eastern Europe and and, and the artifact, um, it is well known that there is a hierarchy of value in World War Two artifacts. Um, and if you're talking about the armies of World War Two, um, American is worth more than British by and large because there's a lot of American collectors. And if you want to make the big bucks, then you go for German. And if you want to make the really big bucks, you go for German SS. Um, because there is this sort of dark glamour around the Waffen SS in particular, um, which makes which which gives material which has an SS provenance a, a um a, a, a premium value and in fact um, a lot of the um, dug material that turns up 
um, on eBay and at military affairs and so on comes from Eastern Europe and it comes from battlefield burials that haven't been officially recovered. Or it comes from battlefield uh, burials that are recovered, but before they're handed over to the uh, the authorities, they're stripped of uh, things like badges, particularly if they're in good condition. Can, can you perhaps clarify about this issue of dark glamour? Because this is, hmm. is it like, it's not Nazi sympathisers, although that's one market. It's a broader, just an aura of the defeated bad guys, is it? Or is it something particularly yeah. Nazi? Is it not the same with Japanese or any other enemy? I don't know. I don't, under, I don't get it. Um, I, I, I know less about uh, Japanese material and Japanese collectors. Famously, there was one guy on the British reenactor circuit who reenacted the Imperial Japanese Army. Um, but... Uh, funnily enough, though, quite a lot who, who represent the SS. And there's a, in fact, there's a, quite a debate among World War II historians and, uh, and reenactors about representing uh, particularly party organisations. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, you, you, um, I remember the um, being in the military show once and you know, I'm, I'm, I've been around the block a few times on this stuff. I, it doesn't take a you know, I, it takes quite a bit to actually shock me these days but there was a a, a family there um and so the the father was representing a, an ss trooper the mother was you know in a uh, full sort of ava brown dirndl and so on and there was a boy and a girl who were both under un, under 11 primary school age i don't even um, want to look while you tell me this you know go on, go on. yeah what you know, what what, what uh, the little boy was uh, junior hitler youth and the the little girl was deutsche Mädchenbund. and i think it's a full set that, and, yeah the full set i thought was that absolutely necessary <laughs> you know we've got photographs we've got interviews we've got uh, it it's uh, you know, do they take that stuff home? Do they? Where's the idea? I mean, yeah, we're 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 in a, in a, this sort of talk about dark humor and dark dark. You know, we're in the um um in a period when it was announced on in right wing circles last weekend that David Irving, the famous Holocaust denier and discredited historian, had died. Then his family put out a statement saying that it actually hadn't. Um, but not before people like Nick Griffin, who used to run the BNP, had uh, published these sort of fulsome obituaries to somebody who was proven to be a, a a liar and a fake historian in the in the high in a high court libel action. Oh. But um, you know that it, 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 there, there there is just just the responses to that. You know, uh, people say, oh, you know, "Respect to David Irving, thank you for telling the truth," and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so yeah, th 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 these are, these ideas are still out there. Certainly, it's something uh, you know. As, as an archaeologist who works in the archaeology of modern conflict, I am very aware of how some of the stuff that we do can be interpreted and can be misinterpreted. And um, I think you know it, it beholds anybody in this field to understand that, particularly on the far right, there are bad actors who will use and it's, in fact we're beginning to see it, it applies to um more traditional archaeological periods as well i mean you know just look at the and i know before we started this recording we were talking about the way some people on the political right now are trying to undermine the archaeologists and historians who are looking at the representation for example of black people in society in pre-modern periods yeah and the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons and so much else. Yes. Well, this has been fantastic so far, Andy, and I, I want to keep talking. So we're going to have a little break now but there'll be, and, and end this video. But I'm really looking forward to exploring this further in a part two. If you've enjoyed this Archeo Death video, why not check out the Archeo Death blog at howardwilliamsblog.wordpress.com.